Good evening, and thank you all for coming. <clears throat> My name is Dulce Johnson. I'm with the Sheboygan branch of the American Association of University Women, which is the sponsoring organization of tonight's forum. <laughs> um, AUW's mission is to provide equity for girls and women through education, research, and advocacy. In that regard, <clears throat> we advocated very strongly for Title IX, which is familiar to all of you, and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act more recently, which is also probably less familiar to you. Um, we do not support candidates. We do take positions on issues especially relating to education and women's rights. Um, we also give a local scholarship every year to a non-traditional woman student. In 2015, our scholarship was awarded to a veteran of the Iraq War. And we were very pleased to help Angie realize her goal. She graduated from UW. She didn't graduate yet? Okay, next year. Okay. She's a student at UW Green Bay. Um, another thing that we're working on is a STEM workshop for girls in sixth to ninth grades. <coughs> that will be November 4th. We're collaborating with UW Sheboygan on that. And um, you'll be hearing more about that. And we're working with Mead Library to present six great decisions programs this fall. So you'll be hearing more about that as well. So the candidates are seated in alphabetical order. <laughs> and the questions will be rotated back and forth between them. Our moderator is Mary Jo McBrearty, also a member of the Sheboygan branch of AAUW. And um, before I turn it over to her, I'd just like to a excuse me, ask the candidates to stand and introduce your name and how many years you've been on the school board. My name is David Gallianetti, and I've been on the school board for 15 years. I'm Peter Madden. And I've been on the school board since July of 2016. I'm Jenny Pottest, and I've been on the school board for nine years. Good evening. I'm Larry Samoth. I've been on the school board for 20 years and 11 months. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Kyle Welton. I am not on the school board. I am a new candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these are going to be uh, very straightforward questions uh, tonight. There are going to be five of them, as a matter of fact, and each of the responders has a maximum of three minutes each to make those responses. Uh, they're, can't, they're seated in alphabetical order, and each of um, the questions will be directed to a different first starter, so each of you will have the chance to be the first responder. The first question is, what are your primary qualifications to be a school board member? Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Um, first, just quick, thanks AAUW uh, for doing this, and, and thanks all of you for coming out and, and giving us a chance to, to hear us before the election in two weeks. Primary qualifications, um, I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, when I left work today, uh, my colleagues knew that I was um, coming to this forum tonight and one of my friends said, why do you keep doing that? <laughs> and um, the answer is pretty simple, really. Um, when you get a chance to, to serve your community uh, in, in a pretty powerful way, um, you take advantage of it. And being part of the Sheboygan Area School District um, is a point of pride for me. Uh, I think our community has a lot of pride in our schools. Great schools are the foundation of any great community. Uh, my qualifications are that, that we, we've seen a lot of change in the last 15 years. Um, some of it, a, a lot of it positive, some of it not so great. Uh, we've dealt with mandates from and, and tremendous change from Madison. We've navigated through it. We work closely with our employee groups. We put our students first. Uh, so I think we have, uh, at least in my 15 years on the board, 
Uh, we've got a strong commitment to having strong public schools in our community. That's a commitment that I've got. Uh, like I said, I think any uh, strong community has strong education as it's based. We're blessed to have uh, a school district that offers a lot of variety and a lot of choice. Uh, and that's something that our parents and that our students want and they can find it in our district. We're also blessed uh, to have a lot of great parochial choices and we have a strong homeschool network and I think those are important as well. Uh, but, but when you talk about qualifications, I think it's the work that I've done. Uh, I think it's the position that the district is in. We passed a referendum this past November with more than 70% of the voters on the first try uh, saying yes, uh, that they were interested in investing their hard-earned dollars in, into what we're trying to do to help build up our school district. Uh, those are things that tell me that we're doing a good job and I'd like to continue to do that job. All right, uh, again, I'm Peter Madden. The qualifications that I bring to the position uh, started with my involvement with the schools as many citizens when their children entered the district and I was um, immediately very impressed with the quality of the, the education and the outcomes they were getting with uh, our two daughters. Um, and early on I asked how can I be involved with the schools. So it started um, most uh, specifically in the middle school at uh, Horace Mann where I was on the, uh, the site-based committee and I have the privilege of going to middle school way longer than my children did because they were they were four years apart so I stayed in through the first one, three years of the first one and then stayed in for the tie over year till the next one came in so I was at uh, at the middle school for that period of time then I was on the uh, the booster club the committee at uh, South High and also have been involved with other committees that the district has asked members to be involved with hiring committees um, siting committees with Jefferson School and then I got involved with something that was new at the time was the charter school um, advisory committee and worked with that group for quite a while and that's where I got to meet Kyle Welton because he was on the board at the same time so he's been he says not experienced but he's been at this for a while um, in all of those things I got to see different aspects of the district at work um, <coughs> the dedication not only of the teaching staff and support staff but also the administration and also the guidance provided by the board and I thought this would be something I would be interested in contributing to as, as David said <coughs> it's a privilege to re give something back to the community and my experience and my focus had been on education so I thought this would be the, the perfect place so when I was uh, elected by the board to fill in a part of the term that was uh, vacated when Barbara Chizinski stepped down. I was uh, pleased to be selected at that point and even with the experience I've had before that it's an eye-opener to be on the board and hear the the things on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. So I look forward to continuing to do that and I'd also like to say that the quality of the current board um, and the boards before that is an excellent place to learn uh, the business of education and I think the proof is in the quality of the Sheboygan area schools. Thank you. Hello, um, once again my name is Jenny Pottest and as I said I've been on the board for nine years. Uh, prior to that uh, my husband and I moved here about 16 years ago and um, I was for the first time in my life becoming a stay-at-home mom. I had been a teacher and so having that experience not having taught here in Sheboygan um, and coming here having kids a lot of them it felt like <laughs> um, it's given me a, an amazing perspective to then when um, the kids were a little bit older and I felt comfortable um, being able to get dabble back into the world of education but not from a full-time teaching position and so the board um, being part of the Sheboygan Area School District Board of Education allowed me to do that so I think the perspective of having been a, a teacher and educator and then from the perspective of being a, a parent um, and a 
um, community member, a taxpayer, has given me kind of a vast approach to the world of education here in Sheboygan. Um, I think I'm going to echo what David said. The nine years that I've had the pleasure of serving on the board, there has been a lot that our, board, our community has gone through um, from a district perspective. And certainly from a budgetary standpoint, we have had to take a look at absolutely every area of our district and the things that were um, working and the things that we had to make some really tough decisions about. Um, obviously had to, uh, we've had um, and put before the community and had passed a referendum. So now managing those monies. Um, Act 10, closing a school, um, vast teacher retirements. Um, they've been huge. And I think that has um, allowed me and, and very quickly uh, an education into what it takes to have that big picture approach for a school district um, and combining all of my different perspectives and how to best serve and support our community. And I'm still passionate about it and um, realize from a very personal view um, what a quality education does obviously at home and I see it in my kids and their amazing experiences but also from a community and that um, we are all better off if we're all better off and I think it absolutely begins and ends with education and wanting what's best for our students and so I'm still passionate about that and I think I have much to still offer towards that end. Thank you. Oops. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. I'm not necessarily comfortable with talking about myself, but um, the question is asking me what my qualifications are. I think it all started when I was a young child growing up in Chicago. I came up here to go to Lakeland College, now University, in 1967. I still can't say I'm from Sheboygan, but uh, our children can. And uh, going back to Chicago, my parents were actively involved in the PTA. And my father created what was a co father's council, which was a part of the PTA. It just got dads involved in schools. And that brought was my start here in Sheboygan, getting connected at Grant Elementary School with our oldest daughter. Um, I retired now as a social worker. Um, but in that role, it uh, connected me to the schools, um, had me involved on a daily basis. And when an opportunity came up to apply for the school board, I wasn't chosen. Ellen Voida was chosen instead of myself by that current board, but I had a desire and an interest and came back to run um, again and was elected. Early in those years, the board was not the board that I was most comfortable with and its focus it was not, in my opinion, on what was in the best interest of students necessarily. It was more on micromanaging. I think it was a lot to do with a lot of the inexperience of the board members themselves. I think they had a passion and they're concerned about students. I just don't think they had the experience of being board members. However, the board's changed over the years and got marvelous and it's fantastic and it's joyful to come every to meetings because each one of the board members has such unique strengths and qualities. It's amazing. And what's even more amazing about it through the process of discussion and deliberation is that we reach consensus. It's rare that you don't see a 9-0 vote on something and there's been plenty of things to discuss. So it really, it really is, it, it's a great experience. But just briefly to speak about myself, I mentioned that I retired as the wraparound coordinator for Sheboygan County Health and Human Services Department. I founded Safe Harbor along with a few other people. I'm on Hearthstone Board, I'm on the Camp Evergreen Board, um, I'm on the Police and Fire Commission in Sheboygan, um, and I'm on the co County Health and Human Services Board. And I mention all those things because, one, I haven't retired. I have time for them. But, but more importantly, this is all about collaboration. And as we move forward, government entities and agencies have to work together. If we don't, we can't get the job done. We can't do what's best for Sheboygan if we're not on the same page. And having these opportunities to be part of all these groups allows me to bring to the board those views, those opinions and express them and helps us, I feel, factor in our decision making. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. My name is Kyle Welton. Uh, and the question of why am I qualified or what are my primary qualifications to be a school board member, I think it starts with my education in the Sheboygan Area School District. 
I was born and raised right here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, the, the son of a pastor and a teacher. Um, and it was the education that I had in the Sheboygan Area School District that has given me the foundation and every single opportunity that I've had to grow, learn, and succeed in the years since. As a student in the district, I was deeply involved in efforts to improve our schools. Uh, I attended Pigeon River Elementary, Urban Middle School, and then I attended uh, North High School and Etude half day for four years. At North High, I was on the site-based management team for two and a half years, and I was also on the Etude governing board for two and a half years, working on different initiatives around culture and how can we get students more actively engaged in their education. Um, I also served as the, the student rep to the board uh, when I was in high school. I went on to Marquette University, and at Marquette, I served as Speaker of the Student Senate, President of the Student Body, as well as graduating as valedictorian in my class. Um, at that time there, I also was the first student ever to serve on a provost search. It's the academic vice president, the number two of the university, working to bring in outside leaders to, to drive our mission forward. And so I, after I graduated from Marquette, I went on to Madison and, and worked at a company called Epic for about a year. But I came back to Sheboygan because I love this community. It's the place that gave me the opportunity to grow. It's where my family's from. It's, it's where I learned. And I was raised that when someone gives you an opportunity, you return the investment. And so coming back to Sheboygan, I now work at Acuity Insurance as a business systems analyst. But I'm also on the boards of Habitat for Humanity Lakeside, as well as the Wisconsin Recovery Community Organization, which seeks to help people recovering from heroin addiction. Um, I've got a, a wide variety of ex experiences. Um, and, and I know what it's like to recently make that transition in an ever-changing world, in an ever-changing economy. And as we think about the education that we want to provide our students, one that can prepare them for a world that is increasingly uncertain, I've got the, the insight and perspective of living through it right now um, and knowing what it's like to be competitive in that job market and to know the, the realities of a, of, of a changing world. Um, I love the Sheboygan Area School District, and as the son of an educator, education has been the cause of my life, and I want to give back, and this is the best way that I know how. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, question number two, uh, and Peter will be the first responder and then proceed in alphabetical order. What are the most important challenges facing the Sheboygan Area School District in its responsibility for the education of youth in the district? Describe your priorities and initiatives for meeting those challenges. I think the primary challenge is the complexity and variability that the teachers deal with in the classroom. The different realities that the students are bringing to the school each day and making sure that the teaching staff, the teachers and the support staff have the tools they need to differentiate and serve all of those needs. Students bring a lot to the school, and some of it is in line with the educational mi mission, and some of them, some activities or, or um, things that they're dealing with might be barriers to education. And I think it's critical that that is recognized and managed. The way I think that's done is by continually to support the professional development of the teaching staff and retaining the teaching staff. I think that's a challenge that many districts are facing and I think it's critical that the district understand how to support, train, make the teaching staff feel valued so we can continue to deal with the challenges that the schools have. One of the things that you're hearing at the state, federal level and certainly in Sheboygan is how to deal with issues such as mental health, how to uh, address homelessness, which is an issue in the district, how to deal with the things, all of the things, the package, the bundle of things that the students are bringing into the classroom and the teachers still have to deal with the, um, the reality of getting through the curriculum and getting things done. I think that's the challenge that we have. How has the district dealt with that? One of the things that the board has done I think is, uh, is very helpful, is to set the goals that are needed for the administration, for the district, and then have the measurable and make sure that we're moving towards those goals. 
I think the other thing that the, the district has been very effective at is been building partnerships with the different agencies, different parts of the community, because this isn't something that has to be handled strictly by the school. It has to be handled by the community. The community has to um, come together with the district, with other agencies, with government, and um, that's the challenge we have, that we can weave together the kind of support and consortium that uh, supports the students with all they bring in so we can graduate, uh, graduate them with uh, the kind of skills they need to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'll use this one. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think the biggest challenge facing our district is probably a timeless one, but I think the um, the environment in which we have to do it is probably the most challenging that it's been, and, and I think that priority is to um, prepare our students for life readiness. And I think that has many different um, ways in which that looks. I think, you know, like Peter alluded to, when those little bodies come into the school at the beginning of their educational career, at the beginning of the year, they um, come to us from all different uh, walks of life and family situations, and that's amazing and diverse and exactly as we want it to be um, and with different strengths and different areas of opportunity and I think in moving them forward through our district and through their educational path um, them being able to realize their personal um, best and goals um, social interactions and appropriate and how to be a successful part of a community whether it be a learning community or you know someday a uh, world and local um, commerce community and um, seeing them through then to whatever goals those are going to be those that's our challenge and it encompasses every aspect of our district whether it be uh, providing our staff our crucial staff um, with the resources and the support needed to support those bodies on the front lines, um, creating and supporting and maintaining the buildings and the infrastructure needed to make sure that they're learning in a safe environment and that we have the best of what we need to make um, each one of those learning days important and valuable and productive. And I think um, balancing all of that with the um, fiscal um, sometimes constraints or um, foundation that is passed down to us from our um, state government. And so it is a big and, and always their challenge, but I think that um, what our um, staff does each and every day, what our district does, is incredible and, and amazing, and we don't always get to concentrate on that. At the board level, we see the things that are that need to be improved, the things that are on fire, and so um, keeping our eye on the fact that we have a responsibility to um, do what we need to do, and and like I said, support all those different entities to get our kids to that graduation day and sending them on to wherever they're going to end up, whether it be the workforce, uh, a two-year college, a uh, university and being successful at that, not just getting them out the door, but getting them to where they need to be and having them um, find success in that, that is our, that is our challenge and um, I look forward to still being a part of it. Thank you. We have many challenges, but I think I'll try and put them into three that jump, jump really out at me and I think all of us on the board Mental health issues in this community are troubling us. They come at us from all different directions. They come at us from traumatic experiences the childs have in the home. They come at us through opiate issues. Other panel members have mentioned homelessness. They all impact the student when they start their day out with us. And our teachers are there on the front lines having to do this and trying to maintain um, the outstanding teaching that they have given our students over all these years that I know I've been on the board and continue to do. So the challenges I see in addition to mental health and our board is working on that and uh, we're moving in a very positive direction with training, services, looking how we can do this in this ever, these times of decreasing financial resources to be able to address a problem. 
and we know we, we can't necessarily do it with just the existing staff we have, so where are we going to find the dollars to even add additional staff? That's, that's problematic. Since Act 10, um, we've had to do this balancing act that's just amazing, and so every two years when the biennium budget is passed by the state, we don't know if our aid's going up or we don't know if our aid's going down or if we don't know our, if our aid's going to be flat, and we have to try and do budgets like this and maintain the staff. Act 10 caused us to reduce 100 teachers. Um, it's just, it, and to think that this doesn't have an impact on what we're trying to do is this, is this craziness. But, but I mentioned three things. The first thing we have to do is find a way to make sure our teachers are appropriately compensated. And we will, we will find a way to make that happen. The second other panel members have said are resources. I've talked about mental health. And uh, the other greatest challenge we face is the Sheboygan Area School District has been on the cutting edge, I can't tell you about so, how many initiatives that we can talk about. You pick up the paper and see somebody, some school district somewhere in the state is putting forth this in initiative and getting press and we can, we sit back and go, oh yeah, we did that uh, th three years ago, you know. So um, it's going to, the, the challenge is to maintain the cutting edge with less resources, uh, supporting our staff, making sure that they, they have everything they need to get the job done. I know this sounds like a lot of pro promises in the hot air, but we can do it because we did it with Red Raider Manufacturing and you know, we did this through partnerships with others. And uh, we, will, we will do this with uh, learning how to incorporate medical assistance billing to bring revenue into our district so we can hire more staff and provide mental health services. And uh, we, we will get the done, but our teachers have been the key to, as long as I've been on the board, to making sure that our students are, are getting the resources that they need and um, we will make sure they have the financial literacy, liberal arts, backgrounds they need, civic responsibility to be best prepared as possible to have a successful life in the future post high school. Thank you. I think the greatest challenge facing the district, I think, is shared across public education, right, especially in Wisconsin. Uh, and it, it ties into the, the two other challenges that we're dealing with deeply, but it's limited resources for the most important investment we have as a society, and that's public education, right? We have to make sure that we're preparing the next generation of students to, to fill and serve the communities of tomorrow. And so, um, you know, we've seen from the, the state legislatures, as other panel members have, have mentioned, right, over $600 million in K-12 through education has been reduced in the last um, six years. That's a, a dramatic reduction. We've seen 100 staff lines reduced in the Sheboygan Area School District to make sure that we're, we're there, but that has impact, right? We've got a class of high school English students at 35. Um, I, I can't imagine trying to teach 35 English students uh, William, William Shakespeare, right? Um, uh, that's, that, that's, a, that's a tough challenge for our educators to meet. They're doing it, but it's stressing them, and that leads into the next biggest challenge that we're seeing across the state, which is teacher burnout. Right? We have fewer people going into education as a profession than we have in history. And it is coming up going to be a massive shortage for us as a state. And the, the more that we, we, we don't comp across the state, right, you reduce funds, you can't compensate your teachers as well. I saw this personally with my mother in, in the reductions that she took after Act 10 and how hard it's been for her to maintain a quality of life um, without cost of living adjustments, right? It's personal. It's real. And so all of this, this, this feeds into another looming threat, um, which is trying to split funding in public education into a private sector. We can't afford two education systems in this country, and subsidizing parochial schools with dollars meant to educate every child is only going to exacerbate the issue. And so a lot of this is out of the hands of the school district, right? But what we can do is ensure that we are building those community partnerships as we have, um, and, and make sure that we're, we're supporting our educators, maintaining those commitments, and being advocates throughout levels of government to ensure that they know that these decisions are detrimental to the future of our students. And I saw it happen to my teachers. Act 10 came down when I was a, a high school student. Um, and the opportunities that I had when I graduated aren't there for a lot of students. There are still wonderful opportunities in the, the district. I want to stress that. But they have been affected. Thank you. 
Um, one challenge that, that I'll mention that, that no one has yet is, is we have to find a new superintendent. Um, Dr. Soderber said he wasn't interested in coming out of retirement, <laughs> so we're still looking. Um, that, that, you know, that, that search didn't work out um, with, with a candidate that we were comfortable with, and, and we're going to continue looking and we're going to find somebody. But that's, that's a challenge that we face. Um, I think partnerships is key too. Uh, Kyle alluded to the teacher shortage. I think that's a huge challenge on the horizon for us. Um, we, we see it across the state in, in uh, teacher colleges that, that people are not going into this profession. Um, I think the profession, for whatever reason, um, has always had a bit of a, a, a black eye and it's got a worse one uh, since Act 10, unfortunately. Um, Act 10 brought about some changes that I think we've been able to use to our advantage to make our school district better, but it's also created some issues that have affected our employees personally. We've got to figure out a way to, to work with our state, work with our taxpayers, work with our employees to overcome that. Uh, part of it too is, uh, and, and a couple of uh, my peers have alluded to it, it's the challenges that our students bring into the schools every day. Um, these kids live through um, some pretty crazy situations. The homelessness, you know, where we're serving uh, two, three hundred students who are defined by the federal government as homeless. And you say that to people in Shibuya, and they're like, what are you talking about? We don't have homeless people. Well, no, you don't see them. Uh, you know, you don't see them sleeping on, on, on uh, you know, over top of heaters. But, but it's, a really, it, it's a real problem uh, when kids aren't sure where they're going to be able to go to sleep at night. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, m mental health is another one, too. Imagine having to deal with all of that stuff as a classroom teacher with 30, 35 kids in the room. And the learning perspective is all over the place. And you've got you've to teach all of them. I think we throw a lot at our teachers, and sometimes I don't know if we do a good enough job of looking at all the programming we have on their plate and doing uh, a good job of deciding what are priorities and what are not in those things that are not priorities, stopping doing them so we don't have them running around like crazy all the time. We used to do some program prioritization in the district, and I think going back to that would be a good idea, but we've got to make sure we're getting input from the employees to hear what's working and what's not so that we decide where to invest those dollars, which are limited, as, as that's been referred to as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to question number three, I just wanted to tell you that we do plan to have a, some, at least some limited time at the end of the formal questioning from, uh, for questions from you from the audience. So if there's something that you're thinking about that doesn't get addressed, uh, Dulcie has some three by five cards here and we'll pass those around so there'll be an opportunity for some questions uh, afterwards. Question number three, and Jennifer will be the first responder. Uh, what do you see as the positive and negative aspects of charter schools in the district? Um, thank you for that question because that was something that, in rethinking my answer from the last question, um, I think needed to be mentioned. Um, positives. Um, in general, I I think a real point of pride within our district is that we are a district of choice and we have provided um, really varied opportunities for kids to be educated within. And, and when I talk about kids coming in with lots of different you know, strengths and, and areas of opportunity and family situations, I think charter schools speak to that and, and um, giving kids and their families choices on how they are going to be educated. Um, I think, so I think that's a positive and I think that our district has done that well. I think we have at a fairly measured pace um, examined them and um, provided a real diverse offering of charter schools that um, have been brought about many times by um, parental um, movements who have said this is what we want for our kids and we're passionate about it and we want to support that and where is it within the district that we can we can fit that in and even boards uh, previous to my being a part of them um, had I think some real um, foresight in making that happen and managing it well. Um, I think in terms of what that 
I don't necessarily think this is a negative, but it certainly makes it a, a challenge then in the management of a district because you do have, in, from some people's perspective, a us against them mentality. Um, and I think that has been one of the biggest challenges in breaking down of um, different doesn't mean better than or less than, it means different. And I think, as I had said before, that we're all better off if we're all better off. I'm better off if, if a your child is receiving the education that's perfect for them and it works for them. And so um, I'm very excited about the fact that we, with as, as a board, we have put a moratorium in for the last two years um, on charter schools because I think from our perspective there were lots of big things going on in the district and like I had said we had some really um, uh, great relationships with our charters and schools that we're working in and we're really adding such great diversity to our district but to do that it, it takes a lot of work so we'd put, put a moratorium on it within the next year one of our board goals is to, to kind of take a look at where we are with char charters but um, as David pointed out we're, we're finding a leader and I think with doing that that will give us another opportunity to really take a look at where our charter schools are and and how we can best continue to serve them and the part that they play in our district and um, where that leader comes into play with that and so I I think it's an ever-going discussion thank you um, the charter charter movement uh, came to Sheboygan as it did to many other communities with the idea of offering other alternatives to education. The strong proponents of charter schools of course said our model is the best way to do it and if you give a, let us do it we're going to get the best outcomes. I don't think that's factual and I don't think the data necessarily proves that. I mean, there are so many different factors that go into a student's success starting with parent involvement. But that said, charters really in our district we thought could be incubators, could be opportunities to try things that we couldn't do in our traditional educational buildings. And um, initially charters got off to a pretty poor start because the model that the proponents of that charter school chose was, um, was a model that I don't think was really current in educational uh, practices and um, then you factor in personalities and then you factor in misunderstandings and you factor in fear and threats and all that and um, it, it became qu quite a controversial thing but we got beyond that as a district we talked through it I think we recognized the importance of it I think that we got to a point when San St. Dominic's uh, wanted to join us and solicit us that I think we were at a point at a board where we were comfortable with it and there were enough board members who felt strongly to say let's just give this a chance and see where it goes and I think that's worked out beautifully. Leadership Academy is helping bring back that neighborhood right now and um, students are moving, parents and students are actually moving into that neighborhood in order for their children to attend that school. I think uh, some of the negatives are uh, that I don't like the fact that charter schools are in the same building as a regular school. We had an incident at Grant that didn't work well I'm not saying that staffs uh, were plotting against it. I don't believe that for a moment. I just think that charters are unique in themselves, that they have certain freedoms and allow them to allocate resources in certain ways that our public skills can't. And I think the fact that when you see that and you're in the same building together, that breeds resentment. And I don't think that that's, and currently we have that going out of Pigeon River. I'm hoping it's working out well. I haven't heard that it hasn't. But I think that's the biggest negative of charters in our district is to try and have them in the same building. Mm -hmm. But um, overall, I think it's been a success. I'm glad there's a moratorium. And I'm glad we're a district of choice that gives parents opportunities. Uh, as many of the people I worked with have thanked us as a board for giving their kids opportunities where they may not have been successful in a traditional school setting. Thank you very much. So I have, I have a unique perspective on this is I graduated from a charter high school, right? I attended Etude all four years, half day, and was at, at North half day. So I tell people I got the best of both worlds. Um, and, and I really do believe that. Um, now, I was a student when I was at North that would have been fine full day at North, but I really liked some of the educational opportunities I got at Etude, the project-based learning. It, it fit with me, and I was kind of an arch geek, and I still am, and so it, it made sense. Um, my sister, Lindsay, on the other hand, really struggled her first year um, at, at North, and uh, my mom was looking at, at the opportunities and saw Etude and said, that might really work well for Lindsay, and Lindsay's great, and 
grades improved at North and at Etude the next year. Um, it was something that gave her a revitalized passion for learning. So I think the, what previous panel members have said, um, what the, the charter program does is it allows parents to, to have autonomy in the model that their child is, is learning in, right? And that's exciting and that's good. And what we know is that each child is different and that you get these opportunities to, to look and explore models that, that work for your child. Um, I think um, it also allows for some, some innovation and an excitement and, and staff can benefit from each other. And, um, it also allows us to, to learn more about the way students learn, right? I think in terms of negatives, I think one thing that uh, Jenny had brought up and I experienced as a student is that us first them mentality, right? There was certainly contention. I was a student at Etude. I was also student body president at North High. Um, and some people thought that was really strange. Um, and for me, it was about, I, I love the school and I love the opportunities that I've been given. And so that, that us first them mentality, that com competition can get really nasty at times between students. I think that it's gotten much better in the district since I graduated, but there were some, you know, some arguments in the hallway um, between students going on about it. I think the other is that uh, sometimes it can Charters by themselves are limited in their, in their student size, and so they will inherently have smaller classrooms. And so that smaller class size is, is great, but it can also lead some frustration for other schools where they're seeing larger, larger student class sizes that are, are going on there. So again, I, as a, a benefit of the charter education, I think it's good to have that choice, that opportunity, with the same accountability that comes with any public school. Um, and that oversight, that's key, that's critical, right? It, it, it's public education. Um, but there's always a, a, a positive and a, and a negative that comes along with it. Positives in my mind. Um, choice these days is something that parents expect. Um, choice, uh, public school choice has been on the books in Wisconsin for, for more than 20 years now. And choice used to be defined as the ability to live on the north side but but choice in the south and the amount of intra-district choice that we have students that are attending a school outside of the boundary where they live is is massive i mean we've got we've got students choicing to schools all throughout the district and it's sometimes based on a lot of times it's based on convenience of dropping my kid off picking them up for work etc but choice is something that that parents expect is going to be there. So as a district, in my mind, we're obligated uh, to meet that choice. To the degree that we can do it through charters, all of our charters, and I think this is one of the biggest positives of our charters, all of our charters were grassroots efforts. They weren't top-down dictated administration saying, okay, we need five charter schools and these are the ones we want. No, these were groups of educators and parents who came forward and said, we've got an idea for a different approach. Not all the charters that have come forward to the board have been approved. A lot of them have. We've, we've put together a, a, a pretty rigorous um, plan, uh, uh, guidelines that you have to meet in order to get a charter school. Uh, we've alluded to the moratorium. We haven't gone through the process in quite a while. But there's a pretty rigorous uh, set of guidelines you have to meet. These parents and these teachers took it upon themselves to, to put together a, a plan for the respective schools that we've got. Um, some other people have mentioned it. We know that kids learn differently. And to the degree that we can offer programming, and we had people who were motivated to start programming that matches the needs of how some of those students learn, in my mind, that just makes our district better. Biggest negative, in my mind, is perception. We've had charters for how many years now? And we still have a lot of negative perceptions, I think, that are attached to our charters. They are public schools. They don't charge tuition. They have their own boards. They're under a contract. We need to just continue to do a better job as a district. And I don't say the charters need to do a better job. We need to do a better job as a district because the charters are us. We're all, we're all one big happy family. We've got to do a better job of educating our community about what the charters are and, and why they're an important part of our district. And, and they make our district whole and successful. I'm an unabashed supporter of charter schools. So I'll start from that point. But I want to take off from where David left off, and that is the public education to let people know what a charter is. Charter 
discussion of charters is all in the news, it's all over the state, all over the country, and people have to understand what that means in Sheboygan, that a charter school of the Sheboygan Area School District is a public school. It is uh, overseen by the board, it has its own board, so there is accountability, there is rigor. Um, I think if there's any place that we got off on the wrong foot, it was in not making that clear to everybody within and without of the district. And I think that has been a long time in coming, but now it's been naturalized a little bit, uh, primarily because we have a lot of students who've gone through the elementary, middle school, and high school charter schools. And they seem to be doing pretty good. <laughs> so, Not and bad. I think that, that that's, that's the proof in the pudding. So I think it's it's important for people to understand what they are to not feel threatened by them. I mean, there's some very practical upsides to this district having charter schools and having the flexibility where people can move around, where students and families can choice into different schools. That helps us with facility management. That's not a small thing. That You can put people where they want to go and that helps us to balance out the resources. Um, Schools are expensive. Running them is, is uh, uh, a challenge, and I think creativity and intelligence is a really good way to attack, attack that. The best thing about the charter schools has already been mentioned up here. It gives a variety of opportunities to students and their families for how they might want to learn. It also is a thing that helps us understand at a kind of incubator level how to go forward and do things. I think some of the mistakes that were perceived at the beginning of uh, the rollout of charters were the most beneficial things that happened because they said, why did that happen? We didn't expect that. Um, they're much more nimble than trying to move a big ship of a neighborhood school when you're saying, that didn't come across at all the way we thought it would. Let's deal with it. The fact that we improved to the point we are now and the acceptance we have now, I think is is proof that how charters can work. And I think they have done that. So the more the merrier. And I think one other thing, I think where the size of our district really helps us because we have the resources, we have the variety of, uh, of people and instructional capabilities that lets us really take advantage of that charter schools and I'll stop with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question number four. What are your views on Wisconsin's voucher programs and their future? How do you understand the effect of vouchers on state support for public education? Well, and if, sorry, if Larry, you got to go first. Okay. Um, I will tell you, I uh, don't have to say a whole lot about vouchers because I'm totally opposed to vouchers. Um, uh, Kyle mentioned it earlier, you can't have two educational systems in the state of Wisconsin and expect, and if you're going to be crazy enough to suggest it, you better put money behind you. But to take, uh, our aid has gone nowhere but south. And our aid has been reduced from about 46 percent down to 42 percent, and out of that 42 percent of the aid we get, they take the money for vouchers out of that 42 percent, so maybe we get, we, maybe we net 36 percent. It's just doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't think that children necessarily get an edu a better education uh, in those kind of environments. Uh, I don't think that uh, it's comparing apples to apples when they look at testing. I don't think they have to provide the same type of services from transportation to special education to <laughs> other other opportunities for students that public schools have to do. The state is talking about increasing aid for uh, the schools this year, thank goodness. However, they're also talking about increasing aid for voucher schools. So that means that that's going to come out of our pot. So if they say we're going to get something, it's pr we're probably not going to really get that. Um, I think we've grown accustomed to, to things like that and are fairly insulated. But I could never support vouchers in Sheboygan. I don't understand the concept. I think when parents make choices, and we talked earlier about parents making choices for charters, when parents make choices to send their kids to parochial schools, they're doing that for a particular reason. Um, 
and I think they make make a decision, and I think they need to find resources in order to make that happen, and not at the expense of, of the public education system. Um, I think that there are political motivations behind vouchers. I think they want to use vouchers, especially in places like Milwaukee, to um, destroy the public education system in Milwaukee. And I think if they had their way, they would probably do that nationwide. And I think uh, w within the strengths of our legislative ability, we need to do everything possible to uh, prevent that from happening here. We're already impacted financially. Some of our students do, ch do choose to attend uh, voucher schools, and our aid is reduced accordingly by that. Um, it's just not a good idea. There are so many ways to channel energy into improving education, and this isn't one of them. No, you're good. The greatest threat to current public education funding and future funding for public schools is voucher programs. Right? We just saw in Congress a couple weeks ago they introduced HR 610, which would turn Title I funding into a block grant for voucher schools in in the states. Right? would drastically affect uh, state schools all across Wisconsin. We've seen the, the want to increase voucher programs in the state of Wisconsin as well from, from Governor Walker um, and members of the, the state legislature. We cannot afford two education systems in the state of Wisconsin. We can't afford it in the United States. Um, parents pay in to the public system and they are provided an education for their children already. Um, it is not the role of the government to subsidize their choice to choose a, a private entity, right? I use the example of I chose to go to Marquette University. When I graduated, I had an option. I could have gone to UW-Madison or, or Milwaukee, and it would have been a cheaper education. I chose Marquette because it was the right choice for me. I didn't proceed to go to the state legislature and lobby them to give my parents their tax dollars back so I would have uh, a pretty much the same comparable tuition at a private university. I accepted that responsibility on my own. And that's the same responsibility that parents accept when they choose to send their child to a parochial school. Um, it, it, introducing it into Sheboygan, again, we already talked about how we've had to, to reduce 100 staff lines. Um, talk about splitting off 20%, right? Um, it just is going to increase class sizes and it's going to, to harm our students and it's going to put a bigger burden on our educators. Um, I'm 100% opposed to it and it is, it is not in the spirit of public education and the system that was originally envisioned by Horace Mann. We good? Okay. You'll get no argument from me. Um, there's a little over $440,000 that's levied in our community, local tax dollars, that gets sent to Madison as part of the voucher program. That's, that's real money that comes from our community that goes to Madison that, that is distributed through the voucher program. Um, it, to me, it's simple. If you're going to accept public tax money, you should have to serve all children. That's the expectation that, that that's on us, right? We we can't turn anyone away. We can't decide which students that we want to educate. Now, does that mean that all parochials and private schools are are selectively denying kids? Not necessarily. Frankly, um, a, a lot of private and parochial schools don't have the budgets to be able to serve the students that we do. Some of the special needs st students that we serve who need one-to-one -one attention because of whatever variety of challenges that they've got, um, it's tough educating kids today. And if you're going to take public money, in my mind, you have to serve all children. It's just, it, it's really simple. That's the only way to have a level playing field. Otherwise, the independent schools, the, the parochial schools, the voucher schools, if you will, are always going to be on a higher level playing field, always. Um, I'm concerned um, about the role the federal government might be playing in expanding the voucher program moving forward. Obviously, our new Secretary of Education is a big fan of vouchers, and I think we have to watch carefully um, 
there, there's a, an emphasis in, in Washington right now with de-emphasizing government, right, and eliminating departments, and that's all well and good, but if you take those federal dollars that are currently funding important programs and just turn them into voucher programs and do that across a national level, I, I think it's a real threat to public education as we know it. MPS has a lot of problems uh, and I have no doubt that there are some really gifted teachers there who are trying to work hard to work with those kids, but the sins of MPS are not the sins of all the public schools in Wisconsin, and I think we get sucked up into that sometimes, that it's easy to point to MPS and say, look at the terrible job those public schools are doing. It's not reality. Look at Sheboygan. Look at, look at a lot of the other districts that are doing an amazing job and doing things like charters right. Those are the s stories that we need to tell. Those are the things that we make, need to make sure that our lawmakers know, and you guys can help us. I, too, am against vouchers. And I think the, uh, the, the discussions up here have been, have been very eloquent in what, what the problems are. Um, I don't think we're going to wish them away. I think they are going to be have some sort of an impact on us. I think there's going to be, they're going to get bigger before they get smaller. And where I think that leaves this district, this board, is how do we deal with that? Um, primarily, I think our, our, fo our focus has to be to make sure that we can attract the students and their families to our programs. I think we have a very good start in doing that. But um, if their vouchers are here to say in some way, here to stay in some way or in some form or at some level, um, I think the efforts has to be on the part of the communities to support the public schools and indicate to the, uh, the entities that are, <coughs> are pushing that that we really should focus on paying the public monies to the people who are educating all the students. Um, but we also have to make sure that we don't take for granted that they're all going to come to us. They may not. And I think we still have to put forward a very high quality uh, education. The question earlier is what do you think the biggest challenge facing us is? And of course I always come up with really good answers after my time is over. <laughs> but I think one of the challenges that, that a district and a school board always faces is getting your message out and explaining things to people not telling them what they should think, but make sure they understand what the facts are. This is how a charter works in this district. This is how vouchers work. This is what you lose. This is what you gain. And I think our job is to say, people will, will get this if we explain things appropriately. And if we don't, like I said with the charter experience, then we have to fix our message. So <coughs> I think we're going to have skirmishes about vouchers, maybe worse, uh, in the coming coming years, we need to be prepared to deal with that and that reality. And I think the best uh, defense for that is to continue to have excellent schools. Thank you. Um, so the beauty of being the fifth speaker is um, basically what I like to say is ditto. Um, I think it's been incredibly well um, explained and um, addressed and I think f from being part of a school board and, and um, having that big picture view from a district perspective, we have had the opportunity to see from the beginning of vouchers and how it has played a part here in Sheboygan um, and their impact and so as Peter said, you know, not necessarily our job to, to um, advocate for, um, you know, you have to believe this, but I think to educate of how it actually affects our, our district. And I can certainly appreciate how from the Milwaukee Public School perspective why vouchers became, came about and why they were important in providing um, parents and um, children opportunities to seek uh, an educational setting that they weren't able to get from their common neighborhood schools. Um, where they were living. That makes sense. Um, in terms of Sheboygan, 
as we've said, we are a district of choice and we've provided charter schools and uh, I think really, really amazing uh, neighborhood schools the vouchers and the opportunity for families to, to use those monies to take their um, uh, state per pupil allotments and put them to a private school just doesn't make sense. And especially when we've seen, um, since vouchers have been applicable here in Sheboygan, um, the vast numbers of those taking advantage of those voucher monies um, are families, students that are already attending private schools. So it wasn't giving them a choice to leave a school that wasn't working for their family. It was using public dollars to pay for private education. And as you know, our um, panelists have said, uh, I don't think those were public monies needed to be used. And if a family does make that choice, that is up to them to, to finance and support that. Um, it is becoming a problem that, or a, an issue that from a national level with um, the new Secretary of Education, we are going to be having to face in a, a very real, um, very impactful way very soon. And I think um, that is a issue that um, advocating to our community and having them understand the ins and outs and the facts of it is incredibly important, but also our job as a board is to advocate to our um, state and local representatives and understanding the decisions they make at the state level and the impact that they have locally are um, incredibly important and they need to have all of those facts. So I think that's our biggest challenge too is making sure that we are advocating to those um, lawmakers and helping them make the best decision for our district. Thank you. Uh, and we're on to question number five. Uh, and Kyle will be the first responder. What are your views on the Common Core curriculum? Yeah, so um, I, Common Core is a touchy subject. Uh, and I think Common Core came together with the best of intentions and had a rushed implementation that has drawn criticisms from both sides. Right, so Common Core started with uh, initiative from the Governor's Association chaired by Janet Napolitano um, and was lauded on both sides, right, saying that we want to make sure that when a child graduates from a public school, whether it's in Tennessee or Massachusetts, that A or that grade point average means the same thing across state lines. We brought together reformers and, and education advocates and said, how do we, what does this look like? What does the, the curriculum look like? What do these standards all look like? And then when Common Core was adopted and put into place, it just so happened to coincide with the Great Recession. Um, it was put in place through the, the national program Race to the Top. And so it was how do we quickly implement this by grabbing at federal dollars that are out there. And so there was rushed implementation in a lot of states and a strong criticism from uh, conservatives as being kind of an avenue for pushing a, a liberal view of agenda and from liberals as an avenue for more paperwork for teachers. And so um, uh, what I can say is I support the idea of making sure that we have standards across the board for children so that that education means the same thing when you go across state lines. It's important that we as a society value education and say these are the things we expect our generation, next generation to know before they go into the workforce. I think the challenge has been is how do you manage that on a national scale and it comes down to the level and you have teachers saying I'm spending more time filling out paperwork than I am producing lesson plans. And so um, I'm, I'm a big proponent for local autonomy when it comes to curriculum, um, but also meeting national standards. So I'm not trying to be wishy-washy on this. What I'm saying is it's an incredibly complex issue. And again, I support having a, a national standard and saying where our students need to be, but I think that the implementation was rushed and that it was done to, to grab at a large chunk of money at a time when everybody was wondering where funding is going to come from, um, and that's made it exceedingly difficult. So um, both that, and, and you hear similar things from, from education leaders on both sides in the state of Wisconsin. So again, I support that common standards for what our students should know um, and I think it's up to our educators and the community to come up and make sure that we have curriculum that meets those standards. I would agree that um, there needs to be some kind of a baseline, but, but I think local control at the end of the day has to prevail. Um, 
who best to decide um, what our local students need than those teachers and those administrators who are in the buildings working with those kids. There are different ways to, you know, if I, if I want to drive from, from here to, to Plymouth, there's several different ways that I can get there. Some are more efficient than others. Some might be more scenic than others. The bottom line is there's different ways to do it. None of them maybe is wrong. There's just different ways to do it. Local control has to prevail, in my mind. We've got to let teachers teach. The other thing we need to, to, I think, do is make sure that we give teachers time to collaborate together. When you get great educators in the room together, working together, um, good things happen. They have time to talk about individual kids. Have you worked with that kid? Yeah, I've worked with him. You know, here's kind of what I've found. Um, we need to make sure they have time to collaborate with one another because good things come out of that collaboration. So every time, and I alluded to this earlier, every time we put another thing on our buildings to do, it's just one more thing that they have to do. We need to do a better job of stripping away those things that we've put on them in the past that don't work anymore and understand what those are. But as far as Common Core goes, I, I agree with Kyle. The, the intent makes a lot of sense that there be some sort of a baseline so that when a kid graduates from high school, whether they're from California, Wisconsin, New Jersey, wherever, there's a skill set that we would assume that a graduate of a, a high school in, in the United States has. There's just different ways to get there. And I think it's up to the local educators. They know best how to get their kids to, to, to those positions, and, and, and we can get that. You know, who's going to oversee it? That's the other challenge, I think. One of the biggest challenges with Common Core is who's going to oversee it. You know, we've got all these batteries of, 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 of testing and all this stuff. You know, I, we need to always be looking at how much time we're testing our kids between um, state assessments, federal assessments, whatever assessments. Um, sometimes we assess too much. Um, we, 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 have, we have too much time on testing. Uh, and, and it costs an awful lot of money. And, and where does it really get us? So I think local control has to prevail, but I think obviously having standards is important as well. I th yeah, I think there's two things that have come up again that uh, the comments here. First of all, goals are important. They should be understood but they shouldn't be dictated what the, the pathway to those goals are. I think that echoes how the charter schools and the differentiation that happens in every classroom works. It's like we need to get to this point, but there's different pedagogies, different skill styles that we're going to use to get there. So I think it's important that everyone can recognize what those things should be so it's not a free-for-all. The other thing that I'm getting a sense from the district and from the the debate about this is to put them in perspective. The idea that there is a number or a grade or some sort of a metric that says that defines this school <coughs> versus that school. And that's a struggle because if that's how you're going to play the game, then people are going to teach to the test or they're going to get that number because that's going to be the issue. And that may be good if that's what your game is, but if it's educating students and recognizing their variability, that's probably not the good way to go. So I think this needs to recede a little bit from the foreground as the single yardstick of a school success and be put in perspective with the other things, the improvement, how well are we handling the other challenges that the, the students are, com are bringing into the school. Um, so I think it, maybe like everything else, it started out and we're still shaping it to fit, but I think the local districts have to make those decisions and the local people will support it or indicate that they want to see some movement and I think that's the way the, the system should work. Sure you got it? Um, yeah, I think the um, explanation by Kyle was was well done, and I think the um, 
it just in education in general it is a pendulum and we have extremes and we go back and forth so you know years ago before I became part of the um, district I remember going to a information setting that um, actually Maeve Quinn put on a former board member um, about No Child Left Behind and what those ramifications were and how that was going to specifically ex um, affect our district and um, so yes as Kyle alluded to the um, race to the top um, money is kind of we're replacing No Child Left Behind and so what did that mean and the idea behind Common Core um, I completely understand and there w there was a need for that I can I can appreciate that but as he said that you know the timing um, certainly did not allow for the rollout to be as successful as it can be which can be the case for many things when it, you talk about an uh, original idea or an initiative and and the actual impl uh, implementation of that it looks very very different um, you know from a from a state level it's our reality so our state accepted those dollars and so that is our reality and I can appreciate now from a, a teacher's perspective there being some um, some real challenges with that in that um, there is no uh, every day looks the same there is no because this is what I'm teaching in fifth hour it's going to look exactly the same in seventh hour because here's the deal my kids in fifth hour are very very different in seventh hour and so when you're talking about conformity in education it just doesn't exist and so I think th the pendulum on common core uh, that will begin to swing back and I think I have always had a uh, from the front lines trust in our local educators and their ability to um, do what's absolutely best for our students and every all of the challenges that they have um, I think the it has been incredibly taxing and and um, with everything that our teachers have had to go through it has I don't necessarily know if it's done them always um, real favors but I think there is real opportunity for um, success in that and I firmly believe that we will find that about whether it be from the pendulum or just the amazing efforts every day of our teachers to make whatever initiative it is work for our students and um, you know for where we're going as a whole as a district and I think Common Core is is part of that Thank you. You know, one of the problems with going last, <laughs> and, I, and I think back to a number of events that I spoke with at a school board member where the mayor was present or the county board chairman or, or the legislators, and by the time they got to me, it was like, what do you think of those badgers, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but anyway, on the subject of Common Core, I think a lot has been said here, uh, of which I certainly agree with, but most importantly, I don't think you can, in a country our size, I don't think you can approach educational standards in a cookie cutter fashion, okay, and just say we're going to do it the same. I think in Finland and Norway and countries that have limited populations, not limited, but populations that are 350 million people, I think it's much easier to establish nationwide standards and gear your whole approach to that than it is in the United States of America. And, um, I think what I really like what's happening here um, in in our district we we developed academic career planning and uh, under our superintendent's leadership and suggestion the board accepted that whatever pathway a child chooses the ACT requirements for that particular profession is where we need to channel our energies to make sure they're ready when they leave us to be able to to meet that guideline and I think that independence in c local curriculum and local control is really the way to go. Um, I, I think it's important to have testing but we all know that testing is a snapshot of what's occurring on a particular day and then let's factor in what did, the, did that child eat breakfast that morning? What was it like at that home when that child took that test? What if they have a learning deficit that we don't understand? So I think we really run into problems when we do that and then as other, so other panel medals have so excellently stated and then, then you want to get us into comp competition with each other and say okay we'll give you dollars based on how you perform on, on this. It just, it just isn't the way to go. So I think it, the answer really, I understand it was well intended 
I, I, I don't think it met its goal. I think it's an example sometimes where all of us in this room go, we need national government and we're glad it's there. But sometimes some of those ideas, maybe some bureaucrat sitting in that office came up with that, you know, <coughs> but didn't figure out the nuts and bolts how it's going to actually happen and apply and, and actually work across across this wonderful country of ours. So, um, thank you. I don't I don't need to go on any further. But uh. thank you. Uh, we did get a couple of questions from the audience. Um, what are the most important qualifications in your search for a school superintendent? David, go. We'll go back to you. I think. Uh, well, there's several that come to mind. Um, someone that can be the face of the school district. Um, someone that um, is a visionary. Um, these are unique times. They're changing times. We've talked about a lot of challenges tonight uh, regarding funding, regarding the unique needs of students. And so it's someone that is able to be a visionary and is able to motivate people to be visionaries. Um, we've got a lot of really skilled, gifted employees in our district. And um, getting them to, you know, the, the old cliche, think outside the box, but, but getting them to be visionaries as well about what can happen in their individual classrooms and their individual schools is important. Understanding public finance is important. Um, being a champion of public education is important. Is important. We talked about some of the challenges that public education faces. Um, they've got to be um, in the ear of of our lawmakers and in that sense uh, I go back to them being the face of the district that's important I think the other thing um, that's important is we have to understand that it's not going to be Joe Sheehan Joe Sheehan is going to cast a pretty long shadow he's been you know in the game for for a long time and um, uh, has a very positive legacy that he's leaving behind uh, and we need to let the next superintendent not be Joe Sheehan uh, and I think for some people, uh, th that's going to take some getting, well, you know, Joe wouldn't have done it like that. Well, that's okay. Um, Joe did a great job, but Joe wasn't perfect, and he'd be the first person to tell you that. So I think we need to be okay with the next superintendent not being Joe Sheehan. I think it's important to recognize that decisions made by a school district, by the administration, by the board, have impacts for a long time. You want to put up a new building, you figure the life of a school building is 80 to 90 years. That's a long time out to say these decisions we're making now will shape what the school and this, the community does. So the visionary part has to happen. The ability to lead and get people to work together um, is, is critical and a person who understands the community, the resources that we have in the community, not just the financial resources, but the support that people are willing to show to the community, the schools, and the other institutions here, is something that person needs to understand fairly quickly and uh, embrace because there is no one institution, one government agency, one group of people, one business that's going to be able to move things forward. It's been mentioned by several people this evening that it has to be a, a, a combination <coughs> of a lot of different entities of different individuals with a, a common goal and um, willing to go shoulder to shoulder to move things forward. But somebody has to articulate that and I think the school uh, superintendent is a very good spokesperson for a, a consistent view going forward for the things primarily in education but that spills out into everything else so that's the kind of strength we're looking for experience in making those calls experience in making those contacts and uh, the personality to to always be the happy warrior to keep things moving what does it um, I think first and foremost, um, we need someone who's going to be able to take this, um, you know, the 10th largest district in the state and be able to hit the ground running. I think someone who has obviously a, a strong 
understanding of the importance of education and, and the ins and outs of, of, of the curriculum and the fast moving um, needs and um, priorities of what our students have. Obviously someone that has an understanding of the financial aspect and the HR perspective of um, hiring and supporting good staff. I think, um, yeah, he has, he or she, she has to be um, an amazing um, advocate for education but represent, representative of our district, whether it be within the community itself but to the greater state um, and education world and um, someone who, who has a firm grasp of that entire um, district um, goals and needs. I think one of the most important things that the superintendent that we are looking for needs to have is the ability to um, be a good listener, be open to uh, the very talented staff and support staff and EMT that we have, the board, but at the end of the day needs to be able to make a decision and to support it and to own it. Um, and I think that's a hard combination to find, someone who has the ability to um, admit when they need uh, input, support, maybe they've made a mistake, um, but then the ego to be also able to um, lead and lead strongly. And I think, um, you know, we have been spoiled with um, Joe Sheehan. I think he's been a great superintendent, um, but I do believe that there are some amazing candidates out there, and our district is is this is a desirable district. I think people want to come and be a part of us because I think um, we've done a lot of things right and made a, a real impact on the state level of a, a district that um, values its teachers and um, expects the very best for our students and does what they need to do to m make sure that is available. And so um, that starts and ends with our with our leader. And so um, I think our our quest for that leader is um, going to end successfully. Thank you. Well, the list is getting pretty long. Uh, but I, don't, I agree with everything that was said. Um, I think Sheboygan is currently going through a renaissance right now. I think you look around and you see it's, we're operating on all cylinders. The chamber is talking with the Economic Development Corporation, city, county, School districts are working together, whether it's laying fiber optic networks and doing it together to save costs. We're all, we're all on the same page, focused on what's best for Sheboygan. So certainly whoever our new superintendent has to be, has to be somebody who's quite comfortable working outside of the Sheboygan Area School District and open to partnering with everything else that makes Sheboygan. I think um, another opportunity would be if that individual came to Sheboygan and fell in love with Sheboygan and said this is where I want to raise my family or if I have a family or they've raised the family already or he or she um, that this is where they want to be this is where they want to be uh, one of J Joe's strongest capabilities I think is that he's very comfortable with himself and that he has a leadership style that is not afraid to make mistakes that is not afraid to delegate that when somebody goes out there and makes a decision and it doesn't work out wrong or correctly, instead of focusing on the problem, he sits down and seeks a solution. He looks at people's strengths and builds from there. So in addition to all the other qualities that were mentioned here, I, I, I would like to put forth those. Um, I do believe the candidate is out there, the right one. Um, and I agree with what David said. Uh, 16 years is a long time. You get real comfortable. Uh, and watching Joe grow from our um, head of hu health and of human services and become the person that he is is just an, a, a beautiful story to watch. And I'm sure there is somebody out there who can uh, lead us in our next chapter. So thank you. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I had the fortune of serving on the provost search at, at Marquette University and it was a really incredible experience to be a student on an executive level search at a, at a high profile university. Um, uh, one, it was how do you seek consensus from the community that you're going to install somebody who's about to lead. Um, and I think the most important lesson that I learned from that search is that um, 
the, the qualities that define the leader you pick can't be found on paper. Um, the resumes are going to be impressive, and there are astounding leaders that will apply for the job, but it just may not be the right fit for that moment. And so I think when we think about the next superintendent that's going to come into here, right, we've talked about there's a, a lot of changes going on in education. Um, I think it, it comes back to, I define leadership as putting values into action. What does this individual value in terms of public education? Is it the, a, a guaranteed quality education for every child? And that we are going to allow parents' choice with, within the district. Do we value our staff um, uh, and, and the quality that they bring to the community and making sure that we retain them? Um, it's also somebody that understands that you're only as good as your team. <coughs> and that this administrator is going to have to recruit other associate superintendents over time and make sure that we have a cohesive team, a visionary that's a consensus builder, right? Someone that can inspire a shared vision and carry forward and champion the mission of public education in Sheboygan and the Sheboygan Area School District. And so I, I think that falls in with all the, the qualifications we've been talking about here, but really, it, it, again, it's that that unknown. We had some phenomenal candidates that came, came to campus, but there was one man that was right for the job, and it was Dan Myers, right? We, we made the selection. It was unanimous. Um, it's those qualifications that don't appear on paper, but in meeting with them and understanding this is somebody who's going to be a servant leader, who's going to put the interests of the children, family, citizens, and taxpayers of the Sheboygan Area School District first, build consensus, and make sure that we provide the best education for every child. What role should the arts and music play in the curriculum requirements? And Peter, we'll start with you. Okay. To well educate our students, they have to be well rounded. Um, I know that there's STEAM is, is uh, popular, science, technology, but I like when they add the, uh, the A in there the, for arts. I think that's important that in addition to engineering and math that students are given an appreciation and an understanding for the whole spectrum of, of education. I think what that really becomes important is people are going to have to be very, have the ability to be critical about the information they receive. There's a lot of information being out there and it's sipping from a fire hose. People have to be able to make a distinction. And I think the humanities is one of those ways that we can kind of inoculate people against getting bamboozled. Of course, having a strong base in science is also important because sometimes science is being treated as a very fungible um, topic and it's actually not. So I don't think, I, I don't like the idea of playing one type of educational focus against the other. I think there has to be, we have to find a way to make sure that all of those things are represented and brought to the students and that they can understand not only what they mean and be able to pass tests on them, but see how they're significant in their life and how that's carried forward. A lot of that has to happen outside the school district. It has to be the community. It has to be the family. I know there's a lot of talk about how the school district is going to be that uh, device by which all things are achieved, but of course it's not. There's, I remember my own, my own daughter who, of course, went to public schools, and she had been uh, doing taekwondo, and she had mentioned that uh, there was a, so another person, that she, this was middle school, or or a little earlier, and she said another person was there who was homeschooled, and this was uh, his, like his phi ed part. And I said, well, you're, you're homeschooled. And she looked at me and said, well, no, I, I go to school. I said, do you go to museums? Do you have conversations? Do your friends? I said, if you only think the education you're going to get is in the school, you are going to be shortchanged. Education happens all over the place. It happens in the community and in the home and in institutions and in churches and in all sorts of places. And we have to understand that that integration doesn't start and stop with the school district. It's a community issue. 
and I think that uh, circles back to all of those different aspects of education have to be seen as important and taught not to say, well, we're going to get rid of music and punch up math. <clears throat> I think the arts and education is incredibly important and I will tell you why, a personal story. So I, um, my husband and I felt it was incredibly important the, um, from the very beginning, you know, reading to the kids, even when I was pregnant with them and, and taking to them to museums and those kinds of experiences. And so much to the fact that we made it a priority to, even from a preschool perspective, put them at the art center. And, and I was so excited about the fact that they were going to get this really amazing education where, you know, gallery walks were a part of their everyday curriculum and, and art every single class time, would be from a music perspective, from a, um, taking a look at so many different things and, and outside of the box education model. Um, I literally had, at the time, could be since that has changed, but the only student who when it came to the first um, conference you come in, you're talking to um, the teachers and how is he doing and what's going on and well, um, your student has um, argued quite eloquently that um, he will not be partaking in the gallery walks. He's made it very clear that um, art is for sucks, I believe was the words he used, and that um, if indeed they did take him into the galleries, he would be touching the artwork. So we're, we're letting him make that decision. I'm <sighs> all right, you've got to be kidding me, but all right. So um, that dream was dashed, but yet I persisted and um, put them into, uh, from a elementary standpoint, the elementary school for the arts and academics, charter school. Um, I'll get him art-based education if it kills me. Um, and indeed, you know, those were not his strengths until he was in the drama class. And um, a kid that would say all day long, I'm not good at it, I'm not whatever, found his voice and um, found something that he could still play the sports that he wanted to play and be the squirrely kid he was, but then also could um, find his people and find his success and his um, joy in drama. And he wouldn't have found that if not for his school experience, even though I was trying so hard on the home front. I was educating all I could. Um, so I think it's incredibly important, I think, for all kids to have those opportunities that um, and I'd, certainly makes them a more well-rounded student, but just a I think it makes us all better people, so I'm a firm advocate for that. Thank you. I keep forgetting there's a microphone over here <laughs> to my left. Um, it's, it, of course, we need liberal arts and we need to expose children to every opportunity possible. And um, us sitting in this room have been blessed to be parents and have children or be ch children of parents who have given us wonderful opportunities. But we have many students in our district that aren't afforded the same opportunities and exposure to, th to, to life and to know how to question or to, uh, to have an ability to participate in something whereas the choice outside of school is trying to figure out how I'm going to survive or how I'm going to um, do my homework or where am I going to do my homework or all the other pressures that they may face. So I think we really have a, a duty and a responsibility to make sure we're giving those opportunities to every one of our students. It's not easy in these economic times and we've been blessed with a partnership through the business community of coming to us and, and um, helping us create Red Raider manufacturing and that certainly gives <coughs> students opportunities if they want to go to the world of work when they leave, if they just want to get a taste of it if they want to get credits for a technical college or uh, they want to go to Lakeland or some other college, they'll be well prepared for it and they'll have an opportunity to do so. But that can't be the only way we prepare students. And so um, I think we have to take a look at how we're delivering services right now. Um, let's, let's remove the hormone factor from middle school for a minute. Uh, as we know how that, that can impact students and learning, and, and, but let's take a look at maybe our middle school model and how we deliver things and opportunities we create. I think more opportunities exist within the high schools than they do, but perhaps at middle school uh, we can find a way to afford uh, different opportunities by doing some restructuring that don't necessarily require additional dollars that, as we've all said here, we don't, we don't really have. 
Um, we, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that our students all have the soft skills. It's one thing to ask a question. It's another thing to know how to ask the question so that you don't get punched, okay? Mm -hmm. or, you, or, or you don't start World War II. Um, so uh, civic responsibility and financial responsibility are all other areas that we owe our students the opportunity to be the best they can be so that they're well prepared. So um, I echo what my peers at the table have said. We, we can't rest on our laurels. We've got work to do. And it's a very important area that we have to focus on. And this can't get ourselves stuck in the tracks uh, and let dollars drive things. We've got to remember what we're all about. And that's providing a well-rounded education. And we owe that to our students. We owe that to Sheboygan. I believe that the arts and education go hand in hand, right? It, it's critical as we develop the, the next citizens, the next educators, the, you know, uh, doctors, lawyers, um, construction workers, factory workers, it doesn't matter. It's critical. What the arts do is they're, um, not trying to sound cliche, but they really are a window into humanity, right? They develop emp empathy. It's the ability to look in and walk in somebody else's shoes, and it's that that same touching moment, right? This isn't a new idea to it. Plato and Aristotle talked about both in the, the Republic and the Nicomachean Ethics about the value of the arts in cultivating the soul and how important it is, the, the stories of Homer, right? I'm a classics minor, so indulge me here. Um, so, uh, but uh, when, when, when I think about the, the role that it played in my education, right? I found, as, as, as Jenny had alluded to, I found myself on the stage at, at Urban Middle School and then I got super, super involved and I was able to, to go out and push my boundaries and, and be um, somebody else for a little while. I met some of my best friends. And I also had friends who weren't all that keen on the arts, but they got the exposure to it and gained an appreciation for it. I think you can look right within my family, right? So Josh is the oldest, Kyle's the youngest, the tale of two brothers. Josh went and he played, he played football all four years and really didn't want to do much with the arts. Kyle did theater all four years and was you know, really uh, involved with that. Um, but as we both graduated, I grew an appreciation for physical activity and, and for, for sports and like that. My brother grew an appreciation for the arts. And it's because we were both exposed to it right in our public schools. And that's, that's really the core of it there. So we have to protect that as part of the curriculum, as part of the instruction, as part of the differentiation and the way that we reach students. The arts are a medium through which we learn. Um, and, and I'm a, a core proponent of the value that they add to the classroom. So the two uh, most influential high school teachers I have were Mrs. Heck and Mrs. Vasil. I grew up in central Illinois, a little high school of 132 students. There were 38 students in my graduating class. And Mrs. Heck was my English teacher. Mrs. Vasil was my music teacher. And Mrs. Vasil, I played the clarinet. Didn't do it particularly well, but <laughs> I was there. And um, she fed my music knowledge. And um, she just kind of had this inkling. And so I would borrow her LPs. Remember LPs, right? Everybody in here remembers LPs. And so I would bring home Wagner's Greatest Hits. You know, she's feeding me classical music, Wagner's Greatest Hits. And I, you know, a little Beethoven, a little Bach. And what I developed as a result of borrowing these LPs was a real love for the Romantic era composers. So I'm, you know, 16, 17 years old, and I'm borrowing from the library the complete Mahler symphony cycle because I'm loving this stuff. The denser and the heavier it is, <laughs> the more I'm into it, man. And I'm still all about it. I'm on the Sheboygan Symphony Board of Directors, and, and you know, I, I love that stuff. And what I didn't realize at the time was she was feeding my musical interest and, and helping me tune into that, but she was doing so much more than that. She was feeding my creativity. She was helping me grow as a person because I'm talking to my peers about it. Now their eyes are kind of glazing over and I might occasionally get somebody to come over and listen to five minutes of one of these records and say, my God, what are we listening to? <laughs> but she saw something in me and she fed it. And the arts 
the music in particular. And now I'm, you know, trust me, I, I love a good rock and roll band as much as anybody. I, there's no bigger fan of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers than me. And I love the blues and I love jazz, but that's the beauty of the arts. For me in particular, it's music, but that's the beauty of the arts is it's all of these different things. And, you know, I, we've heard about well-rounded education and all that stuff. The beauty of public schools is we plant these seeds in our kids and we fertilize them and we watch them grow. And different seeds grow for, di for different kids. And if we take some of those seeds away, then we don't know what plants might have grown. And, and, and that's the, that's, that, that would be a horrible thing. So the more seeds we've got and the more sprinkling we can do, the better. And arts, absolutely. That concludes our questions for tonight. Thank you, candidates. I think we are fortunate to have a very good slate of candidates. Unfortunately. <laughs>